This actually will, uh, um, this will make sense in raising a daughter. Hmm. Well, I'll take all the help of you. Yeah. And the title is, What Sparks Your Creativity? So, this so will be a good is, presentation. Yeah, this will be good. It's just totally impromptu. So this is something we did in our office. It's called a pe pecha kucha. It's a Japanese word for a quick, instant uh, presentation. It's 20 slides, 20 seconds a slide to get your point across. It was open to any subject you wanted in the industry. Mm -hmm. So, But one of the things that I wanted to focus on before I start the presentation is this conversation. I always have a be between what is your left side and right side of the brain doing? One is technical, one is artistic. If you have a child, you know what that is. Mm -hmm. It's very evident every day when your child is playing. No rules, no gravity, no no opinions. Mm -hmm. um, as we get older, we start to layer in logic. You know, we learn things and we become sort of balanced or imbalanced for that nature. So artistic people are constantly misunderstood or not, or not properly understood because of the way they see the world. And this is this affects architecture. So how is your brain wired? So obviously there's a left and a right side and we see that very simply as one being almost a, a circuit. And the other side is literally, a, a, it's just uncontrolled flowers and you don't know what's Irrational, going on. Irrational, unorganized. It, it, yes, and it's just sort of, but there's a balance. And what happens in our industry is that this balance is taught constantly at threats with the left side. The left side is the only way to justify my paycheck my existence, my title, what my client needs. The right side is is the is it's the big reason. What's the inspiration? What drives this human condition for all of us? We all seen two ducks in this right. picture, but some Not people see two rabbits. rabbits. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, so this kind of describes whether you're left brain or right brain. Mm -hmm. Now, it, we're a lot of architects and artists are both sides. So we I see. see both we, sides, we, yeah. So if you see both sides, you're really in a very interesting place, and you're probably in a minority. Uh, as architects, we grew up with the vision, the visionary Howard Rourke, the fountainhead, mm. the classical architect that sees the world one way and one way only. But and Rand, his fate, huh? and Rand book, which is which is a human condition book. Uh, but then, the, the, if you follow the novel, how the criticism of the world bears on the visionary, mm. and they try to break him, because what he was doing was not explainable at the time. Um, and you can see that in anything you do today with technology. The picture here is the Shiriko. It's a timeless picture. On the left is what, are, is, is what the left brain person will tell you. It's illogical. The vanity points don't work. Something's wrong. It's, it's skewed. It's, it's, it's distorted. On the, on the right, anybody on the artistic side will see the logic behind this image mm -hmm. and how it is literally this melancholy, timeless uh, portrait of a village. So there's two ideas here going on between the left and the right. One is an a priori. It's what a child understands from doing something they've never done before. Mm. So they, they know this works because of the action that they took, not because they understand it. An adult will blow a bubble because they know exactly what's going to happen. Mm. And this is called the a posteriori uh, um, kind of logic. And, and you can sort of see the, is, is, a, is the original idea something that's never been seen or is it formulated from things that were seen? And so this sort of this is a, a constant challenge. So the question is why? This is Jerry Cooper. This is the founding father of our company. Okay. He, uh, Ninety-one years old. He still comes to work every day, and he constantly is asking us why. Wow. What is the meaning of what you're doing? And then he walks away, and he leaves us in a confused uh, state of mind. Hmm. Um, but so the one argument has been that there must be a third eye, and it's the mind's eye. And this is his idea. Now, I, just to make fun of it. Um, well, they're, they're write, people write books about this stuff. It's been going on since the Renaissance mm -hmm. and the Golden Ages is that your mind has an eye. Mm -hmm. and it sees it actually, if it's, if it's working correctly, your mind will see something. But what do we do as designers? We draw. We just draw and we draw and we draw and we draw. On one side is data. The other one is we're almost there. We, but it's the <laughs> same image. Mm -hmm. we're, we're constantly searching. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to children. Children see this every day. And we, everything we do in society is we try to take it away from them. Um, but then we will get there. We'll get to this aha moment. Uh, we don't know how to get to the aha moment. Athletes talk about it all the time. Um, artists will tell you that they were doing something and they fell down the stairs and it hit them in the head. A scientist will be having a cheeseburger and realize he should solve the formula that nobody could solve. Uh, um, here's an architect that did it, Akeo Ado, a Japanese. Obviously, there's a sketch on the left of what, what he visioned for his for this church, and there it is, the church built. Mm -hmm.
So it's is is so is it was it, this is a moment almost a childlike moment. Mm -hmm. He did he had an idea, and he saw it through, mm -hmm. and he didn't worry about. Oops, sorry, I have to go backwards. Um, um, you know, he he didn't have to worry about at the moment the budgets and all the things that lawyers and everything. There's another one, Frank Gehry, what he did. Frank the, Gehry, my favorite. The the, the, the museum in Bilbao. Yeah, there is a logic to the sketch oh, that's is, above. This is, this is the Spain one, not the yeah, other Yeah, this one. this is yes, in, in Portugal. That is why so, I have to go there. So <laughs> you, you look at the sketch and you say, well, he this came from that, or did this come first? And it's hard to now you're not sure where where it all comes from. Where idea comes from. So, that's but what, what, what really makes it all different in architecture is that there's a story behind it. And the story is what drives things. It drives a child's play and it drives a, 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 an artist's vision. It's sort of this uh, this creation of something that starts to explain the world. So you can look at architecture as a sort of, as, a, as another sphere of music and art, or maybe perhaps architecture is sort of this bridge between the two. Where music, architecture as time is described as frozen music and architecture can also be described as a harmonic composition of forms similar to music. Um, so this is a building that we did in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. The challenge was a small building built up against a tall building. And what we told the client was that we were going to design a flamenco dancer. That oh our building, God. in order for our building to be noticed, she had to be different than the tall building. So we, we correlated the tall building as a man our building is a woman and we created the sweeping curves of a dress and we said it's very simple when it's over and the dance is on no one will ever look at the man right and that's what's happening yeah. here in this project that, that we we created a, a contrast yeah, the eye um, is drawn immediately so to those curves. correct immediately. And, and and the idea really is that at this point the stories was driving it and literally this is how it was presented to the clients um, Another project that we did in Atlanta was uh, a small hotel called between two tall, two taller hotels. So we saw the city as a as a bookshelf, tall mm -hmm. books, small books, but we wanted to make our book more special. So we made our book the smallest book by by no choice of ours. So we said, let's make it white. Let's make it. How do we make our building stand out? So we sort of saw, sort of almost a, a very friendly relationship between the art our building and all the other tall ones behind it so you know the book is small but it sits very proudly on the shelf that's new york this is in atlanta atlanta yeah so the question we'll leave you here with is then the question is never why but it's why not mm -hmm. and the why not takes you from the from the left side to the right brain every time mm -hmm. it makes you think the other way and that's the presentation seamless flawless yeah, and that's Jerry very Cooper good. right there, very our, good. our founding part, father very of the firm. There was one slide which uh, stuck on me, and you had mentioned that yesterday also. A priori and post priori? Yes. Is that how? So, I, in, in my slide, I will show you, I, I call something, I come to a point and I say that hindsight versus foresight. Is that the same thing? Yes. Hindsight is, hindsight is post priori or pre. Hindsight, hindsight would be post priori. Uh, if you if you walk and you see something that looks like shiny ground that you step on and you fall three times, then you start to realize, wait a minute, that could be ice, and I need to. Right. So I think there's a certain distance that's involved, which is time, for you to process what a post priori a, a, a moment is. Yeah, the hindsight is what more logical thinking, left side thinking, is very good at. Yes. Because you have done that, been there, you have mastered it. And that part of the brain, which is wired very logically, does that very well. Correct. But foresight requires that wondering question, why not? Why not? You have to be explorative, you have to be fun-loving, yeah. playful, and not afraid of, you know, Correct. And, fa and, failure. And, and there's a certain, I would say, with a, you know, in a, what I tell people in post Peori is that basically you now have fully convinced yourself of what your intuition was telling you all along. And I think we're, this is where a child or a childlike moment or a moment of madness, you don't, you sort of can't tell. You just know why you, I, this is what I want to do and I cannot explain it. And then there's so much time spent trying to convince yourself of something that is almost unexplainable with it inside you. And it's those people that ask the why not are the ones that are sort of sparking the creativity that we're seeing mm -hmm. in, in our world. Not the digital numbers and things like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just that you, you got to you you need to balance your team out.
Ah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that story which which you were talking about where Flamingo Flamingo dancer, yes. Flamingo dancer was the inspiration of that building, the hotel, hotel building. That was hotel building, right? Correct. We had a tall building mm. and we were building a smaller building in front of it. Mm. And there was a lot of conversation between the ownership. Well, how will my building in the front stand up if it's the smaller one versus this really tall building behind it? And we noticed a few things in the tall building had vertical lines. So we knew that we had to go horizontal with it, but that was not just, that was too easy. And we came up with this idea that if you've ever seen a flamenco dancer, it's a, it's a moment where you see two people dancing, but it's all about the woman and her dress and how it moves. And that's the where the where it's where the fashion and the music come together. So we came up with this idea that the building would be the dancer and the tall building would be the male counterpart, um, drawing all the attention towards the dancer, of course, which was our ultimate intention. So... Um, we met with the client and he at first didn't understand a lot of the, the mathematics and the logic behind it, but it wasn't until we sat down with him one day, one-on-one, -on -one, and I was able to sit down with him and I explained to him by analogy, if you, see, if you were considered a flamenco dancer, you would understand how this comes together. And we drew the flamenco dancer in front of him and he, for the first time, saw the building. Um, so the, the great part of the story was that we had this moment he approved the, the design. Three years later when we opened it, um, the president of the company, another gentleman, mentioned that if you understood the building, you had to understand flamenco dancing. And he asked me to the stage to explain it to everybody who was there that they had been working on the dancer for the last three years. So mm -hmm. that's a great moment in architecture where an idea transcends sticks and steel and all the and things. And builds an experience. And, of, and, an and a story which survives. So I'm going to draw it for you guys here so you oh, can see the... Yeah. So we literally sat with this gentleman and he was a very intuitive gentleman. And I sat with him and I said, listen, if you've ever seen a flamenco dancer, you know, what you see is, 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 very, is, very, is very important. But, but the only thing you'll ever see is how she moves. And as soon as we did this very, very simple sketch, he understood for the first time why our building was going to look the way it was going to look and why the other building was going to be what it needed to be. And then typically we would have said the flamenco dancer, the male is dark. So he's always in sharp contrast to the beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. and, and for us, that was how we won and how we did this project in mm -hmm. Charlotte, North Carolina. I just took a note and one, one of the things that I just wrote was um, there's a thing called one pen mm. and it, there's an article I read a long time ago but this particular architect and he the way he conducts his meetings and we practice this at work all the time it's called one pen so I'm on the board and I'm drawing mm. this is the idea and somebody says oh I have many I think you should do this and what we do is this we and give you, you the pen Exactly. One pen, one pen, one voice. So the, I give you the pen, you come to the board and you draw and you, you're allowed to talk. But you're only allowed to talk when you have the pen in your hand. So it, it's a way of creating in, in, in a sort of a circle of people, one consistent voice, different ideas, but it's, it's really, it's an interesting thing that we've learned as architects. We Eliminate also the noise. And by letting one, only one person have the pen and speak, it's it's a it's sort of a very very kind way of saying this is inclusive and we want it is inclusive we want to hear what you have to say not like it, and and the judgment is by passing the pen back and forth and say well if you're not making a contribution yeah give it back the pen the pen will shut you up mm -hmm. because people will not respond to your to your sort of idea my favorite um, architects who are they make a wild guess number one Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry. Yeah, I think you react. Because this guy is he, out of the league from any other architects. Even when he's con conceptualizing the idea, when he says that now this is the idea, and then when he's creating the specification, right, mm -hmm. in order to build the kind of material and the, how you bent it and twist it and how do you make it structural, mm -hmm. this guy is 
all through end to end very different bejenke no it's oh, not jenke his last name is jenke big big uh, big big yeah yeah burner burner ankles yes yeah, yeah, yes i and can't he, spell his he, name and yes and there, those are two different architects one frank gary obviously the older one yeah and i think frank gary like most of us were taught in school that architecture is a process and it and form follow function that literally the function is what dictated the frank gary is all about function and, follows me around and, and i think and i think what it, it, he in a sense sort of like many architects realize that the, there is a form based approach that is more uplifting than just the solving the functional aspect of a building see in him is that you see an artist yeah an artist driving design yeah um and and i think he at times you, you, people will criticize him for well this doesn't work as well as uh very hard another to build. building or this building over here leaks over here but if if you're if you're in that that part of the spectrum having that conversation you've missed the entire um thesis of what he's trying to explain to you that you're still talking about it and you're still interacting with this building in a very do, new and a different way and then i mean if you think about it in justification for, for what he does and how he does he is designing museums he's designing public places if you go back 200 years ago if a king is thinking about building his castle okay if um, you are building a church those were primarily inspired by form i mean function has to follow i mean you have to have bedroom you have to have conference hall you have to have reception all of those things but basically they were um mostly driven from form because that has to give you wow first then right. meets your ergonomics need isn't that and i guess to some extent frank gehri is doing that because he's designing mostly public places museums correct correct public buildings uh, opera houses opera houses symphony halls galleries yeah, yeah. things that were it's a, it's a different relationship with the human yeah so and what is his this guy's name guy again i forget yeah, his yeah. name but it's my it, i think it's uh born ingles bergard ingles yes he's yeah. from new york and now he's in new york yeah he's got a big office in new york but oh, yeah. what's nice about his work is that i think he he so sort of like your pyramid i think he understands the the memory part in creating a series of he diagrams his buildings in such a way that through his diagram and he he transcends the form the functionality the program and he starts to really elevate buildings to another level of, you know i've seen his building of, in denmark and so he's slightly different than that's my perception I, i don't know if that is true he designs for function first oh without a doubt he he has a pyramid and the pyramid is program ready let's go okay it's all about program functionality cost it's not his his work is not trivial by any means it's more, it is it is logic based it is driven by data it is providing information about the environment and is yeah. is his way of creating sort of a his sculpture. architect plus uh, industrial designer combined what are that, that kind of thing that? right yeah. new material your, new technology who's the third architect huh who's your third architect oh he's not architect or he is a, a more thought leader uh, his name is you must have seen this grand design on netflix grand design this is all about people have ins- aspiration to build new modern homes or uh, sustainable home oh. 